Hi and welcome to Northeast Rider Video Magazine. Uh, today we are on the road going to a suburb in Massachusetts to meet up with Dan. Dan has a unique car collection of American classic cars from the 1960s era and one from the 1950s. Stay tuned. I think you're really going to enjoy today's visit. Hi everybody, uh, we're here today uh, to show you this awesome American car collection of American classic cars from the 1960s era. And with us is Dan. Come on, Dan, how you doing? I'm well, George. How Good you doing, to meet Dan? you. Good to see you. Welcome to my home and let's look at some cars. This is a 1965 Corvette convertible. 1965 was the middle of the C2 production. Uh, and by 1965, the original 1963 Stingray had been significantly improved with disc brakes all the way around. Uh, and in the case of this car, the optional 396 big block Mark IV rat motor, as evidenced by the tag here and the bubble hood, which only came on the 396. The 396 was a mid-year car. This was introduced in March of 1965, and there was only 1,402 convertibles built uh, that year. So it's, it, it's truly a low production Corvette. A lot of people say that. Uh, Corvettes are plentiful, as most people know, if you go to any car shows, but this is one that you don't often see. In 1965, Corvettes came available with leather seating. Most of them were vinyl. This one has leather. This one has power windows, which was an option, AM, FM radio and the teak steering wheel, which was a much sought after option. Uh, it became illegal in 67. General Motors no, no longer offered it, uh, but it really does accent the interior on these cars. And here you have a 396 cubic inch four and a quarter horse V8 engine, affectionately known as the rat motor. Everybody loves a big block Chevrolet. Interestingly, in the Corvette, the valve covers were orange. Uh, whereas uh, in other General Motors, other Chevrolets uh, had actually had fancier valve covers. The Corvette stayed with the orange valve covers. I'm not sure why. Three exhaust systems were available on a C2 in 1965, it was the first year that the side mount exhaust was optional equipment. Um, and it, it's actually a, a, a horsepower robber and real performance Corvettes generally didn't use them, but many were sold this way because they look great and they sound great. There were two other exhaust systems available in 1965. There was a standard undercar exhaust, and then there was a uh, high-performance uh, off-road exhaust system that was also available. This is a 1956 Cadillac Fleetwood 60 Special. The Cadillac Fleetwood 60 Special was designed by Bill Mitchell, was originally introduced in 1938, was considered one of the most handsome cars Cadillac ever put together and one of Bill Mitchell's finest uh, designs. Uh, by 1954, the Cadillac had been redesigned to look ostensibly like the one you see here. These, this basic body was built for three years, and this is the last of the series. The Fleetwood, as opposed to other Cadillacs, was known as an owner-driver, meaning that it was the largest and most opulent Cadillac that an owner would drive himself rather than be chauffeured in. So that the gentleman or madam that bought this car and drove it to the club, if he or she was asked what they drove, rather than answer Cadillac, if they had a Fleetwood, they'd say, I have a Fleetwood. The Fleetwood had an extended deck and 
had Fleetwood letters across the back of the trunk rather than Cadillac. It also used exhaust ports that came through the bumpers. And many people later on discontinued these because the condensation would rot the ends of the bumpers out. But for those of us who love these cars, we made sure that these worked the way they're, they were intended to from the factory. Jeez. The car has uh, rides on a 133-inch wheelbase. Uh, and even though it is quite a bit longer than a standard Cadillac, it has the exact same interior volume as the shorter cars. So Cadillac extended the wheelbase, extended the rear deck on its Fleetwood, but didn't provide any more room inside, which I always thought was kind of kind of odd. The 1956 Cadillac, like most cars of its era, were big and high because people wore hats in that era in their cars. And the, one of the advantages of that, especially with a large car like this, was that the cars tended to be built on top of the frames instead of sinking the floors below the frames as would happen later in the 60s when cars became lower, longer, and wider. But in 1956, Cadillacs were still large cars designed for elegant ingress and egress. You'll note that the floors are flat or relatively flat, you can almost walk into the car. Later on, in, in only three years, and by 1960, Cadillacs, you had to contort yourself to get into them. The roofs had been dropped, the floors had been sunk to get a lower roof line, and the cars were no longer as graceful to get in and out of, uh, but they, they arguably looked better than, than, than these did. Uh, 133 inch wheelbase didn't give you any more interior room than the cars with the shorter wheelbases, but it did give you a, a more luxurious ride because you had a, you sat in, in between the, the longer wheelbase. Um, some of the things that people that know these old Cadillacs know about is they know that the fuel filler is actually under the tail light in these, which confounded many a service station attendant trying to find where you put the gas. This Cadillac is painted dawn gray. Uh, some people think it's pink. It's not pink. It's actually a very pale violet, and it's a chameleon. It changes colors at night. Uh, at dusk, this car is very purple. Uh, and in the early morning, it's very purple. And in the middle of the day, it's pinkish. It has a starlight silver roof, which was an Eldorado color, which you could get at extra cost on the roof of your Cadillac. Inside, we have a leather bolstered armrest, which only came on Fleetwoods. If you had a regular Cadillac, you didn't get that. And power window switches would be just on the door panel rather than, rather than on this rest. This particular car has what is known as a special request order. The, the gentleman that bought this car specified broadcloth bolsters. From the factory standard equipment, this car would have had leather here. But because this car was sold in Minnesota in a cold climate, and I have the IBM cards that show it as a, what was called a SR, special request car, this fella wanted broadcloth, which was actually a, in that era considered to be more luxurious than leather. This is what came in a limousine, this, this wool broadcloth. Uh, th this is known as Bombay cloth, the seating surfaces. Full leather interiors were really not often used in, in Cadillacs, only in convertibles would you see a lot of leather. Leather was not then what it is today. Uh, one of the things that's unique about the 1956 Cadillac is the first year that an adjustable mirror was offered in a, in a, in a Cadillac. So the outside mirror is, is adjustable with a handle inside the car. Seems kind of pointless today to even talk about, but in 1956, this was a big deal and mm -hmm. took, uh, you know, about a half a paragraph in the brochure to describe. Uh, other optional features on this Cadillac are uh, the radio has a tuning uh, foot switch. So you could, you could tune the radio with your foot with a switch next to the high beam. Uh, and the radio is a seek and search. So you could hit the switch with your foot and the radio would go to the next station uh, and land there. Again, doesn't seem like much today. In 1956, this stuff was big. Cadillac offered a 
automatic headlight dimmer, which would see the headlights of oncoming cars through this device here, which has a photo cell in it, it would activate some electronics under the hood that would dim the headlights. It's a very popular option on Cadillacs, and in fact, Lincoln and later Chrysler bought the technology from GM's guide division to use in their own luxury cars. 1956 was a year in which Cadillac thought it was wise to identify the year of the car on the dash. I think later on that probably proved to, to, to not be the best idea in the world, but in 1956, you were reminded that you had a 1956 Cadillac. Cadillacs also featured a center-mounted glove compartment, easier to get to, ashtrays on both sides of the dashboard, another one over here, uh, a lighter uh, in the dash, uh, and then a lighter in each of the rear ashtrays, so you could smoke yourself to death in this car if you wanted to. Steering wheel, steering column? N nothing special about it. Uh, the, ste the steering wheel, well, there actually is something special about this. The previous Cadillacs had a, had a pointed protrusion right here. Uh, it is said that Sammy Davis Jr. lost his eye in a car accident in Nevada when he was run off the road driving a Cadillac, and his head hit that steering wheel, and he lost his eye. That is, I, I believe that is a true story. They did away with that in 1956 for that reason. Well, thank you. Very nice. Okay, Dan, tell us a little bit about the, in, the engine. In 1956, Cadillac made three major improvements in the engineering of its car, which was odd because it was the final year for this body. The 57 car would be all new. But in 1956, Cadillac enlarged its original overhead valve 331 cubic inch uh, V8 to 365 cubic inches, a big, big, uh, big displacement change. It now produced 285 horsepower uh, with one four-barrel carburetor, and the El Dorado uh, dual four-barrel option uh, was available this year. Not many people put it on a Fleetwood, but it was available. This is the automatic headlight dimmer box full of tubes like an old radio, and believe it or not, 1956 was the first year for the Treadlevac power brake unit, which was all new for 56 for Cadillac. And the power steering gear was all new for Cadillac in 1956. So they had all new brakes, all new power steering, and a new engine. Uh, and, and if that wasn't enough, a brand new transmission. Uh, in 1956, the old hydromatic, uh, dual range hydromatic was replaced by the controlled coupling hydromatic, which eliminated the front gear set for a second fluid coupling. The result of all these new gadgets and re-engineered components made the 1956 Cadillac initially very unreliable. And a lot of people had problems with these cars when they were first introduced. As a matter of fact, there's a confidential literature that Cadillac sent out to all of its dealerships in 1956, requesting that when customers came in for oil changes and routine maintenance, that the transmissions be removed and replaced. And if the customer had to know about it, they were told that it was just to provide a more modern transmission. But it was really because they had a major problem with them at first. It was finally straightened out later on in production and later 56 Cadillacs were fine, including this one. But it was a tough year for Cadillac because of that. Well, thank you very much, Dan, appreciate that. Beautiful car. Thank you. How many miles are on this car? What's that? How many miles are on the car? On this one, just under 100. Just under 100,000. Just under 100,000. Wow. Original mileage. Original miles. <laughs> yeah, this, this car is, is very much original, except for paint and chrome. I'd love to see it out in the evening time to see the color change. It's beautiful, and it really is. A, and, and you don't, the blue doesn't come out unless you get hit with the right color. Gonna take you for a ride in my brand new car. Gonna take you for a ride in my brand new car. Gonna show you how the shifter feels. Cause tonight is the night that we make it real. Gonna take you for a ride in my brand new car. Gonna take you for a ride in my brand new car. 
my brand new car. Gonna take you for a ride in my brand new car. You better hold on to the leather and thread, 'cause we're gonna take off like a thoroughbred. Gonna take you for a ride in my brand new car. Look at the stars, know the sun ain't bright. The moon is full, so it's a perfect night. Give me a kiss and close the door, 'cause the night is the night that we've been waiting for. Shines so bright. The moon is full and makes a perfect night. So come along and close the door, 'cause the night is the night that we've been waiting for. I'm gonna take you for a drive in my brand new ride. I'm gonna take you for a drive in my brand new ride. I'm gonna take you in my brand new ride, 'cause I got a new car and the keys are inside. This is a 1963 and a half Ford Galaxy 500 XL. In 1962, 1963, Ford embarked upon what it called its total performance era, in as much as the early 60s was the beginning of the horsepower race in a in a big way. Chevy had a 409. Chrysler had a 413. Ford came out with a 390 and a 406, later a 427. And this particular car uh, sort of embodies that, that era. Uh, Galaxies and Impalas and Plymouth Furies were used on the racetrack at uh, Daytona uh, and other places. These were the cars that America drove to work and that also raced on tracks on Sunday. So they had a a big, uh, they occupied a big place in, in American culture, automotive, automotive culture at that time. This car was introduced mid-year 1963. When it was introduced for the first time in the fall of 62, it had a box top roof. Roof came like this and went straight down, kind of like you see on Ford Thunderbirds. But NASCAR was having aerodynamic issues with that roof line. The Ford wasn't competitive in 62, so For 63, Ford came out with the fastback roof style that they used on this car and on the Falcon. And uh, that was largely the result of the genius of Lee Iacocca, president of Ford, who determined that two model year introductions a year were better than one. So rather than just introduce a new car in October or November, as everybody had been doing, Lee reckoned, why not introduce a new car in April? You'll note that the rear of the Galaxy has these exceedingly large jet pod exhaust style taillights, and that was the motif in the early 60s. We went from fins in the 50s, which sort of brought to mind jet aircraft wings, to jet rocket exhaust taillights. So the Galaxy had these big round lights, which would really make the car look good. Uh, the paint on this car is Rangoon Red, which was a, a Ford Red that a lot of people borrowed and used on other cars. Uh, Ford, I think, used this color for about three or four years. It has a lot of orange in it, um, and nobody else has a red quite like Rangoon Red. All right there, Dan, show us a little bit about the interior. When you bought a 1963 Ford, you could have a Custom, you could have a Galaxy, a Galaxy 500, you could have a Galaxy 500 XL, which stands for extra lively, believe it or not. And this car has that option. Gave you bucket seats and a console with a floor shifter and a whole lot of bright work on the dashboard. This one has optional factory air uh, and uh, padded dashboard, those are both options. Also has AM FM radio, which was the first for any car. 63 is when a a FM radio became available pretty much in, in any car. 
Uh, and it also has a reverberator, which is a box in the trunk full of transistors that puts an echo effect on the rear speaker because stereo was not yet available. Stereo wouldn't be available in cars until about 65, 66. So in 63, to simulate high fidelity stereo, they used an echo effect, which sort of makes the music sound like it's coming out of a garbage can. But back in the 60s, people thought that was really cool, and this car has that. This Galaxy has the optional Z-Code 390 four-barrel V8 engine which is indicated by the badging on the, on the front fender. That was the largest engine available with an automatic transmission. This car could have been purchased early on with a 406 and after April with a 427, four and a quarter horse, solid lifter, monster engine, but that was only available with a four speed. And those were sold mostly to folks going to the racetrack. For the fellow that wanted a big Ford with a lot of power and an air conditioner and automatic transmission, this is what he bought. The Ford hood opens with the badge, which confounded many a gas station attendant over the years. And under the hood is a 390 hydraulic lifter, four barrel V8. These are big engines that make a lot of torque, about 427 pounds. Uh, they're just great engines for moving big cars around. They're not especially high performance, but they're very good at moving these cars from a stop. Now this engine, did you go through the engine once you had the car? No, this car I bought largely the way you see it. As I, as I said to you earlier, it was owned by somebody who had passed away not long after they put it together, and I found it in that condition and realized what a prize it was that this car had belonged to somebody that loved it and who unfortunately didn't live long enough to enjoy it and I am now keeping it for him, whoever he was. Uh, it's a beautiful car. In 1963 and in the early 60s in general, inexpensive cars like Fords and Chevys and Plymouths and Studebakers didn't come with a lot of equipment standard. You basically got a steering wheel and an engine and some brakes whatever was required to have the car on the road legally. But if you wanted anything else, you, it was a la carte, unlike more expensive cars where equipment would come with the base cost. So in a Ford, for example, you had to pay for power steering, and you had to pay extra for power brakes, and you had to pay a lot for air conditioning. And you had to pay for the big 390 and the four-barrel carburetor. But all of those things made the Ford a much more enjoyable car. And for those that could swing the scratch, yep. it was a nice thing to do to option up your Ford as, as much as you could. This car has most of the options that you could get. Uh, it is odd that in the 60s, when people selected air conditioning, they often did not get power windows. And I've got two cars like that, where it's got every piece of equipment and air conditioning but no power windows. And an old fellow once told me that the theory was a lot of people didn't trust power windows in those days, and they figured if I've got air conditioning, I can roll my windows down. Yeah. <laughs> Under the trunk is a very, very big trunk, uh, very wide, uh, but kind of shallow because the gas tanks on these cars are directly below the trunk rather than tucked behind the rear axle like Chevy did. So the trunk floor is, is not deep, but very large. In the, lower, in the left corner there, you can see the Motorola reverberator, which was a piece of optional equipment you could buy, along with a rear speaker and a control on the dashboard that allowed you to put a reverberation on the music coming from the AM FM radio, which simulated stereo sound. It was a neat thing from the era. So Dan, this is a 63 and a half Ford Galaxy. It's a 63 and a half Ford Galaxy 500 XL, which was the top model for the Galaxy that year. Came out in 62, the XL. Oh. It was designed to compete with Chevy's SS, which came out in 61. Oh. And it stood for extra lively, believe it or not. 
the uh, the car is representative of, of what was going on with American cars in the 1960s, which was the mantra lower, longer, and wider. Cars in the 50s had been high roofed, big sort of roly poly cars, you could wear a hat in them. That's what 57 Chevys were and so forth. But when Virgil Exner redesigned the 1957 Chrysler products and made them low and long, and he had the trademarked uh, advertising mantra, suddenly it's 1960. That's when Ford and General Motors were forced to go back to the drawing boards, redesign their cars to look more like Chrysler products with lower roof lines. And this car is sort of a re result of that effort. Boy, the ride is quite nice, huh? This is a uh, frame. It's just, this car is body on frame, body on which frame. is the traditional way to build American cars. Um, General Motors and the Chevrolet had gone to coiled springs by 63 for a more buoyant ride. But Ford stayed with leaf springs in the back of this car, much like Chrysler did. So the ride is a little firmer than you'd have on a Chevy or a Buick or something like that, uh, but still uh, comfortable. These are always comfortable riding cars. Yeah. The suspension is beautiful. It's a really nice ride. Yeah. It is. It's a stylish car. The XL was kind of the way to get to a Thunderbird without paying for a Thunderbird. You know, in the early 60s, a Ford Thunderbird was one of the most coveted yeah. American cars. In my baby book, my mother wrote when, when there was a question, the hottest car on the road in 1961, she wrote yeah, Thunderbird yeah. and Cadillac. But Thunderbirds were expensive. I mean, those cars were, you know, $5,400, $5,500. Yeah. But you could get pretty close to a Thunderbird in one of these. Now back then, 63 and a half, what were these, what were these stickered at back then? This car was, uh, the way this car is equipped, it was probably uh, just under $4,000, $3,800, $3,900. That was good money. That was yeah, good money. because that it has air conditioning and the yeah. top engine uh, and the XL package, but uh, it's still a Ford. You know, yep. It's still a relatively inexpensive car. This was the car that a guy, if he saved a little bit of money, you know, he paid a little bit more than a regular Ford, he could have a car like this, yep. and, and they sold an awful lot of them. This is power steering. Power steering, power, steering. power brakes, factory air conditioning. In, the, in 1960 through 64, Ford did not have in-dash air conditioning like everybody else had, where it was integrated. It was actually, it looks like it's dealer added, but it's yep. actually factory. That's how Ford did it from 60 through 64. In 65, they integrated it into the dashboard. Um, but air conditioning was still probably in less than seven to eight percent of full-size Fords or Chevys. Yep. And yep. they were only 25, 30 percent in Cadillac at that point, so. And you got quite a bit of headroom. Not bad. Not bad for a sleek roofed car like yep. this. Yep. Uh, it's, it's actually, for something as old as it is, it, it's, it's, it's an easy car to drive all day. Uh, some old cars just have terrible seats. Their driving dynamics make them kind of tedious uh, if you drive them all day. This car's not not that way at all. This this car is comfortable. What was the training in this car? Transmission is is what Ford called cruisomatic. Cruisomatic. They called it cruisomatic because you could actually shift it manually, much like today's automatics. Technically, it's called an MX. Uh, it's the old ford o that was uh, improved for 1958 and called cruise o -Matic. And for 63, it was called Select-Shift cruise o because you could, you could downshift it and you could actually start this car in second gear, which very few automatics would allow you to do. And that was valuable on, in slippery cold weather. If you wanted to try to get out of a rut without spinning your wheels, yep. you could start the car in second gear. You were saying, interesting, that the... If you did this, the stick shift, is it the same opening as the automatic? It's the same floor tunnel, right? Floor if you tunnel. bought a stick shift, if yep. you could get a, T, a Borg Warner T5 in these, uh, 
uh, it would come right out of the tunnel the same way this automatic shifter does with a big rubber boot. Yep. And quite a few of those were sold. I mean, these, the, this car is famous for, for the 50 or so lightweights that were built that you may know about. Uh, Tasca Ford in uh, Rhode Island sold, sold a bunch of those. Uh, they actually built about 50 of these with aluminum bumpers, aluminum fenders, 40 Conaline van seats, no equipment, no radio, no heater, and a big thumping 427 V8. And that was one formidable car. And these 63 Fords really did well on the, in, in um, NHRA that year. Uh, these were these were formidable cars. Now, red on red, was that popular? 63 and a half? 63 and a half, was yeah. it The red on red was a... The, 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 well, Rangoon Red, which this car is, Rangoon was, was a very yep. popular color across the Ford spectrum. Uh, I, I don't often see them red on red like this. When I see them red, they usually had a black gut, which I'm glad this one does not have. Yep. Sometimes they had a white interior. Yep. Um, but the red ones, uh, red with red, I, I, I think it's interesting and I like it. This one also has the... See that metal strip going down the center of the yep, hood? That's yep. an option. That was called the oh, hood ornament. Yeah, that was the, that's that the hood ornament. That's the hood one. ornament. You, you had to pay extra for that. You had to yep. pay extra for everything on a Ford yep. or a Chevy. There's not a lot of standard equipment. Basically, when you ordered a Galaxy, you, you, you got a, a very small engine, a manual transmission. You got the bucket seats, but, but that was it. If yep. you wanted anything else, you had to pay, yeah. you know? Otherwise, you just got a hamburger, no cheese, no onions. Now, this was in competition probably with the Chevy. This was in competition directly with the Chevy yep. SS, the yep. Impala SS, yep. yes. Uh, the Impala SS and the Ford XL were both, uh, you know, bucket seat, sporty versions of regular cars, which is why they were popular, because they were sporty, but they weren't, unless you optioned them to be very powerful cars, you you could drive one of these and look the part without paying for it. So many Chevy SS's and Ford Galaxies were sold with smaller engines. They looked like they were fast, but, but yeah. they weren't. Um, and then of course you can option them up that way. It was a very popular thing to do because when you lived on a street in a middle class America and everybody had a Ford or a Chevy or a Plymouth, you needed to do something to differentiate yourself from the other guy. Yeah, so yeah. if you came, if your dad had enough scratch to come home with an XL as opposed to a regular Galaxy 500, yeah. all the neighborhood kids would gather around and go, ooh, yeah, yeah, ah, look yeah, at that. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. so it was exciting to yeah. be able to buy the, the, you know, the special version of the car. All right, Dan, I really want to thank you for spending time today. Talking My about pleasure. your cars and your collection. My pleasure. Bring us for a drive. It's awesome, you know. And we'll hopefully be back. We'll take a look at the, uh, the Chrysler on 300R. 300F. 300, yeah. 300F. Yep. On and its own the, uh, story. And, a, 